Amen. Nothing replaces the true presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of things that people may do to imitate the power and the presence of God, but my friend, it's, uh, there's nothing like the genuine moving of the Holy Spirit. Turning your Bibles this morning, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, and as you're turning there, let me encourage you in this new year to uh, bring your Bible with you to church, uh, whether it's a hard copy or you have it on an iPad or a phone or whatever. Uh, we always challenge you, if you have it on some kind of an electronic device, uh, make sure that you just leave it on your Bible app and you're not surfing the net and all those kind of things. We want to stay focused on God's Word. And uh, today we want to share a message with you, and this is our, our motto for the year of 2020, 2020 vision, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that's easy to say, it's harder to do, but it is completely doable. When we say keeping our eyes on Jesus throughout this new year, uh, I hope that it's not just a motto, but I pray that it is your heart's desire. It's my heart's desire. Something that I've been praying over for the last few weeks, that God will help me in this new year to keep my focus on Him. Focused on Him in my personal life. Uh, focused on Him in our family. And certainly focused on Him in our church. So I want us to look today in Matthew chapter 14. We're going to read verse 22. We'll read through verse 33. A very familiar story of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and where Peter walks on the water. The Bible said in straightway Jesus constrained His disciples or encouraged and told His disciples to get into a ship and to go before Him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, the Sea of Galilee. It's more of a, a lake than it is a sea. And it says, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. This would have been somewhere between 3 uh, a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. And when the dis disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. In verse 28, the Bible says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Peter, I think I'd be thinking of something different for the Lord to prove who he was at about this point in time. Amen? And the Bible says that Jesus looks at Peter and gives him a one-word answer and says, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now don't miss that. Peter is doing something that is completely and totally impossible to mankind. Okay? He is walking on the water. Verse 30 says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and saith unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt, or why did you doubt? And then when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. When you read over this story, most of us are 
familiar with the event, but there may be some among us who is not. The Bible tells us that Jesus and the disciples uh, were followed by multitudes of people. They had gone out of the cities into the countryside, and Jesus had been teaching, and Jesus does the miracle of multiplying the food and feeding the thousands, and as the day is getting to the end, Jesus sends the people away and tells the disciples, get in the ship, sail to the other side, I'll meet you there later. And the Bible said Jesus goes away into the mountainside by himself to pray. The first thing I see in this is that when you minister to others and when you're meeting other people's needs, it takes something out of you. The Bible said that Jesus went away alone to spend some time in prayer to recharge his batteries, if you would. And so he goes off and he's praying. And then during the night, there's a storm that hits upon the Sea of Galilee as the disciples are crossing to the other side. And they are afraid that they are going to perish in the storm. And somewhere looking out through the midst and the, the mist and the rain and all the wind that is blowing, the Bible said that they saw someone a figure walking on the water coming toward them. And their first thought was that it was a ghost. <clears throat> Finally, Jesus speaks to the disciples and says, It is I, be not afraid. And again, we know that in the Word of God, that that phrase, be not afraid, is in there 365 times, one time for each day of the year, be thou not afraid. So Peter is not completely convinced. And he says, Lord, if it's really you, let me come walking on the water and meet you. And I believe that Jesus is, when he hears the faith that is in Peter, he just says, come. If that's what you want to do, do it. Have the faith. Believe in me that you are able to do this. And the Bible says that Peter steps out of the boat and that he is walking on the water. Now, I don't know if Peter took two steps or three steps or ten yards. I don't know the distance that Peter is closing in on Jesus, but that's not important because is there anybody here in this room today who could even take one step and walk on water? I believe about the only way that I could walk on water is if I was in the ocean and I saw a shark. <laughs> I think if I saw a shark, I could make a good attempt at walking on water. Amen? I'd certainly try it the best I could. But my friend, Peter is doing something that is impossible. But the Bible said in verse 30, <clears throat> you pray for us today, it's still dealing with this sign of stuff and everything, and and I, and I really want to preach this, and so you pray for us. The Bible said in verse 29 that Peter is walking on the water. But in verse 30, the Bible says that Peter diverts his eyes off of Jesus, and he starts to look at the storm. The Bible said he looks at the wind. You say, well, you can't see the wind. No, but you see the effects of the wind. The wind is whipping up the waves and, and, and the waves are crashing. I watched a video yesterday that was talking about how these storms come upon the Sea of Galilee, how they come so suddenly and these storms are so fierce and in a, a, and in a, a body of water that is normally very peaceful. I mean, in places of the Sea of Galilee, there are like no waves at all. But when these storms come upon that body of water, there are, are, are just huge waves that are created. And the Bible says that Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and he gets his eyes on the effects of the wind, the waves and all that's going on around about him. And the Bible said at that moment, he starts to sink. Now again, I try to play this out of my mind. I don't know if I don't know if Peter is starting a slow descent. You know, this is something where he starts to feel himself going down or whatever, or or it's like the cannonball where it's just like boom. One way or the other, Peter started to go down in the water, and in Peter's mind, he knows this. I go down in the water in this storm, I'm a dead man. 
There's no way that I could swim. There's no way that I could uh, get myself out of the predicament that I am in. And whether he's going down slowly or whether he's going down like a piece of lead, the Bible said that he cried out to Jesus and he said, Lord, save me. Can I say this to anybody here this morning that is not saved? If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, those words need to come from your lips today. Lord, save me. Because you are sinking in sin. The Bible says, in fact, if you are here today and you have not trusted Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible says that you are dead in your trespasses and sin. You're already dead. And if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, it would do you well to do the same thing that Peter did and say, Lord, save me. The Bible says that immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught Peter and he lifted him up and they, go, they both go back to the boat. And Jesus, I, I can just see Jesus looking at Peter and saying, Peter, you were doing so good. You had your eyes fixed on me. You weren't looking at the storm. You weren't looking at everything around you. You were focused on me. And he's looking in Peter's eyes saying, do you realize that you just walked on water? Peter's a fisherman. Spent his life out on the water. He never dreamed that he could do such a thing, and yet he did it. While he had his eyes on Jesus, he was doing the impossible. There are some things I want us to look at this morning and to take into consideration as we go into a new year. Peter walks on the water. The storm is raging. He cries out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately rescues him. That's an amazing story. But when we talk about having 2020 vision, a, a little twist on the year 2020, you know, you go to the doctor, you love for the eye doctor to tell you that you have 2020 vision. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. The second thing I want us to see today is that in 2020, there will be distractions. Just like for Peter, there were a lot of things going on around Peter that was competing for his attention. Waves are crashing. The wind is blowing. Uh, you know, in his mind, there's all of this other stuff that's going on around him. And he is tempted to take his eyes off of Jesus and to look at this other stuff. I'm here to tell you, my friend, I'm not so naive as to believe that there will be no distractions in, in 2020 because there will be. Just like the little video that played at the beginning of the service, there's a lot of things that compete for our attention in the day and age that we're living. Good and bad things. Families, jobs, school, kids, life events, you name it, there are all kinds of things that are constantly battling for our attention. There are many times where we get our focus off of Jesus and we get our focus on stuff. We get our focus on things. We get our focus on people. And we lose focus. We lose sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we do that, we often become self-focused and not kingdom-minded. We run the risk of letting everyday routines rob us of our zeal and make our worship stale. One thing that in 2020 that I've asked God to really um, keep in front of me and, and, to, and to just really prod my heart with is that I don't get caught up in the everyday routines of things and allow the things of life to rob me of my excitement and my joy and my zeal for the kingdom of God and certainly not to allow my worship to become stale on God. Satan will use anything he can to get you to get your eyes off of Jesus. When Peter was walking on the water, he was doing the impossible. He was able to do something that in his power he didn't have the ability to do. But listen, what was the difference? He had his eyes focused on Jesus. But that very moment that he decides that he wants to focus on something else, the Bible says that he starts to sink. 
Now, friend, don't lose this. Don't, don't miss this. Don't let this lesson go by you this morning. While he was focused on Jesus, he was doing the impossible. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he started to sink. You say, now, Brother Tim, you said at the beginning of the message that it's easy said, but it's harder to do. It is. But as I also said, it's completely doable. There will be distractions in 2020. There will be things that are competing for you and your spiritual focus. There will be things that will come in your life to try to make you and your family so busy that you don't have time to focus on the things of God. So what will make this year different than the year before? How do we keep our spiritual focus? How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? How do we keep our eyes on his kingdom? While the storm raged around Peter, he was doing the impossible. Again, don't forget that. But the first thing that we're going to have to do in order to keep our eyes on Jesus in 2020 is we're going to have to change our minds about what's important. We're going to have to change our mind about what is important. Do you know we spend a lot of our time focused on things that in light of eternity aren't really important at all? You think about what takes up all of your time. <coughs> think about what, uh, what you're so busy at. I heard many years ago, a preacher said, if you really want to see what the, uh, the important things in your life really are, look at two things, your calendar and your checkbook. I guess nowadays it would be your debit card statement. If you want to really see what's important in your life, look at your calendar and your bank statement. And that will show you what's important. There will be distractions in 2020. The difference will be, if we have a difference in our life, is changing our mind about what is important. The Bible said in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus spoke and said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things. Now, what were all of these things? Well, you've got to go back in that chapter and read the things they were talking about before. And they were talking about what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? You know, how are we going to live? How are we going to take care of ourselves? The same kind of stuff that we fill our lives with every single day. Jobs, careers, families, all that good stuff. And they were worried about all of that. And Jesus said, listen, seek the kingdom of God first. Keep your focus on God. And then all of these things will be added to you. See, there's a lot of times in life where we think that it's an either-or situation. We have our focus on God and it's like, well, we got to stop living. Friend, that's exactly backwards. Get your eyes on Jesus and you'll start living. Get your focus on God. Get your family focused on the kingdom of God. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, the things of God, a relationship with God. Focus on those things first. They have got to be the top priority. And that's where the changing of the mind comes in because we think other things are a high, higher priority than the things of God. Again, I saw something a few weeks ago on, on social media, and, and it, it really stuck with me, and it just said this. It says, let church be the reason you miss other things, not the other way around. See, we've got to change our mind about what the priorities in life, what's important. Is the kingdom of God important to me? And if it is, I've got to change my mind, and I've got to change how I react to that. If I'm going to love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, as the Bible has told me, if I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus, if I'm going to seek the kingdom of God first, then I've got to change my mind about all this other stuff that is competing for my attention. All this other stuff that's blowing around, I've got to change my mind about what's important. We said many years ago, when we were raising our two daughters, that when we got up on Sunday morning, there wasn't the question of, are we going to church? 
They knew we were going to church. Our kids never grew up thinking for one moment, are we going to church today? If we were not in church, somebody was sick, something, you know, something major going on, or vacation, something like, you know, something, something that is the, the, uh, uh, out of the norm. We have to change our mind about what we think is important. We need to make Jesus our priority in our daily lives. And the Bible says that He will add the other things into your life. The second thing is, not only should we change our mind about what's important, but we're going to have to engage ourselves in kingdom work. Engage ourselves in kingdom work. (coughs) It starts, my friend, first of all, by reading God's Word. I'm here to tell you, what I'm about to share with you is nothing new, and you hear it uh, many times in sermons and in Bible lessons, that you've got to read your Bible. And my friend, when you look up the statistics, and I looked them up this past week, I don't even want to share the statistics with you because they're so bad. I want this message to be positive, not negative. The statistics on how many people who say they are a Christian, who actively read their Bible day by day, is horrible. Then we wonder why we're so spiritually weak. We wonder why we don't have the power and the knowledge to face the attacks of the devil and, and, and what he sends, uh, you know, how he sends his demons after us and our families and we're struggling. Well, my friend, listen, we need to go back to the Word of God. First of all, that's where God reveals himself to us. The Bible is how God speaks to us, that and through his Holy Spirit. God speaks to you through the Word. He encourages you. He helps you. He educates you. He helps keep you on the right path. If you want to keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to have to get your nose in His book. That will help keep us focused. This time of year, a lot of people enjoy reading through the Bible. They want to read through the Bible in an entire year. And that is a very noble thing to do. As long as your goal is not to just simply read through the Bible in a year. Hopefully as you're reading it, you're studying it, and you're applying it to your life. I have put back on the Welcome Center desk a Bible plan for you to read your Bible through in one year. If you'll pick it up on your way out this morning, there's a copy back there that will show you how much you need to be reading, what days to read, And on the front of it, I even included a thing of of how to read the Scripture and study it as you're reading it. Pick it up, take it with you, stick it in your Bible, use it, and read God's Word. David said, Your Word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You are never going to keep your eyes on Jesus if you don't have your nose in the Bible. Pure and simple. But not only reading God's Word, but applying God's Word. We know that in the book of James, James wrote and he said, when you read the Bible and you don't do anything with it, you're like a man that looks at himself in a glass, in a mirror. And you see what is wrong, and then you get up and you walk away from the mirror, and you do nothing about it. Some of you have gone to church your whole life. Some of you have sat through hundreds, some of you even thousands of sermons. Many of you read your Bible or you do your daily devotions and those kind of things. I want to ask a simple question. How many of those have made a change in your life? How many of those sermons or those devotions that you have read or listened to Have you applied in your life? You have let God do a spiritual work in your life. It's changed an attitude. It's changed an action. It's changed who you are. That's what God's trying to do. The whole idea of sanctification is to take us from our sinful selves and to make us more like Jesus. 
We not only need to read the Word, but we need to apply God's Word. That when we read it, we take what it says and we make the necessary adjustments in our lives, whether it be in our actions, our attitudes, whatever it may be, and we let the Word of God change who we are. In 2020, we need people who will step up and step out for God. I mean, if you're going to keep your eyes on Jesus, if we're going to, as a church, as, as families, as individuals, if we are going to ignore the stuff raging around us and we're going to be kingdom focused, friend, we need to step up and step out. Paul, uh, Peter, he said, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you walking on the water. What was Peter doing? He was stepping up to the task and he was stepping out of the boat. He stepped up and said, I'll do something. If it's really you, I know that you have the power to allow me to step up and to step out. I believe that there are people sitting here this morning that God has been speaking to your heart and you need to step up to the plate, so to speak. You need to step up spiritually. You need to step out by faith and watch what God can do in your life and in your family and in your marriage and in your children and in this church if we will step up and step out. Stop being uh, uh, just uh, people, spectators on the side, but become a participator in what is going on. I believe that chains of, of addiction can be broken. I believe that we can break out of, of old habits we can break out of the ruts and the things that we have been in in our spiritual walk with God if we'll keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 3. I preached on this just a few months ago, but it bears reading again this morning. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14. Paul is writing and talking about the prize that God has for his children. And that we are in a race. And he says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Meaning I have not finished the race and claimed the prize. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Can I tell you this? 2019 is gone. Amen? It's gone. You cannot go back and relive a day of it. You cannot go back and relive one moment of it. You cannot relish in its victories. And you cannot go back and correct its defeats. 2019 is behind us. And we need to move past that. We need to move on. God has given us a new opportunity. The Bible says that His mercies are new every single morning. Every day that you wake up and open your eyes, God is giving you another chance to make it right. Paul says, I am forgetting those things which are behind. And he said, I am reaching forth unto those things which are before me. And he says, I will press toward the mark or the finish line for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The church is the catalyst that God chose to father his kingdom. We see in the New Testament that God focused his attention and his kingdom on the work through the church. That Paul went out and established churches. And they grew from that. And, and more people were saved. Understanding that we can do more as a group than we can do by ourselves. We do the very same thing within the Free Will Baptist denomination. Some people say, why do you have a, a home office? Why do you have uh, the, the, the international missions and so on and so forth? Because collectively as churches, we can do more together than we can do by ourselves. We come together, we pool our resources, 
We pool uh, our people and, and, and our efforts, and we are able to accomplish more together than we can separately. And God created the church to be the catalyst to father His kingdom. <clears throat> so I would encourage you in this new year to attend church faithfully, to love your church, to serve in the church, to give of your time and your treasure, to invite others to come and be with us here in the church. And as Brother Johnny was talking about before we sang a while ago, be engaged in the worship. Be a participator in what God is doing through this local congregation. Now that doesn't take away our own personal ministry out in our jobs and our communities and our families. But again, we can do more together than we can do separately. I want them to show a picture today, and I want to talk about this for just a moment. And guys, I'm going to hit on you for just a moment. When you look at that picture, it says at the very top, 3.5% of family get saved if the child is saved first. The child has minimal spiritual effect on the family. I was in that category. For years, I was the only person in my family that was a Christian. I had to ride the church van to go to, to, go to church. Uh, I wasn't old enough to drive, didn't have anybody to take me. I depended on the church van ministry to get me to and from church. I'm still praying that God raises up people in this church who will have a desire for a church van ministry. We got one sitting out there, and it needs to be running the streets of McEwen and surrounding areas, bringing people to the house of God. But that's where I fit. You move on down, 17% of family get saved if the wife is saved first. So the wife has more of a spiritual effect on the family than a child, but still 17% chance that the rest of the family will get saved if mama is a Christian. Now guys, I want you to really focus in on this last one. 93% of family end up receiving Christ as their personal savior if the husband is saved first. Can I tell you guys something? You have a calling from God, whether you ask for it or not. When you got married and had children, you got the calling put on your life, and that is to be a spiritual leader and a spiritual example in your home. Amen. You say, oh, but my wife, she's more into that stuff. Do you know why? She has to be, because you won't step up and take your position. So somebody has to step in and fill the void. But God intended for the man to be an example to his wife and to his children and to be a spiritual leader, to be one that will step up and step out and be used of God, called of God, to be a man of God. Be